First, a joke from the chief. A substitute teacher asked her students, if you had one dollar and you asked your father for another, how many dollars would you have? A boy in the back raised his hand and said, one dollar. And the teacher looked at him, shook her head, and said, you don't know your arithmetic. To which the boy responded, you don't know my father. <laughs> well, I found out last week that I did not know my way from Erie, Pennsylvania to Chautauqua, New York. I flew into Erie, and if the truth be told, I arrived there knowing that my directions on how to get to the institution were a little fuzzy, shall I say. But I figured all in due time, once I arrived, I would find the shuttle and I'd be all set. However, what I learned was there is no shuttle. In fact, I learned more than that. I learned that you can't get to Chautauqua from Erie. Well, you can, but I ended up taking the most expensive taxi ride in my life. Taxi, can you imagine that? Wrap your head around it? At any rate, once I arrived, it took me a little while to recover from that experience. But it wasn't long before the gates opened wide and I was in heaven on earth. The theme was inspire, commit, act, with worship services, morning and night, lectures, dialogue sessions, a brand new documentary, all revolving around that theme. Mmm, mmm, good. And after mind surfing in a vast sea of ideas and words all day long, the evenings would top everything off with the sound of music. From the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra to an opera another night, a ballet, even bell ringers, the North Carolina bell ringers. Have you heard of them, Burl? And they, can you believe this? They played the flight of the bumblebee. <laughs> bell ringers. I mean, Burl, our chime choir couldn't even do that. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did. I realized that. And, and that was the rhythm of the day. First, the word. And then, then the music. And have you noticed that is the same order found in the collection of Psalms? It begins with Psalm 1, Dick's all-time favorite. The psalm about those who delight in the law of the Lord, in the word and who are like trees planted by streams of water. But then you turn to the very last psalm of the collection, Psalm 150, the text I just read, and those words turn into music. The psalmist lists seven instruments, the trumpet, the lute, the harp, the tambourine, strings, pipe, cymbals, can you hear it? And the psalmist adjures the listeners to make music. Make music with your lives and praise God. And that's the same order of worship which we follow here at the Church on the Cape. I preach the word, we think together, and then whoosh comes the music. And God, through the voices of these choir members, lifts us up where we belong. And then is when we are taken out of ourselves, away from our problems, temporarily removed from the pressures of the day, and through music, we are ushered into the holy presence of God. And Burl, I thank you a hundredfold for all that you do to 
pave the way for the Holy Spirit week after week after week. It is such a thrill for me to be in ministry with you. And I do not take our relationship for granted. In fact, some of you may not know this, but the relationship between pastor and organist, it's not always, shall I say, peaches and cream. Is it, Burl? No. <laughs> One of my former parishioners, for example, told me about her marriage at a church where the relationship was a bit tense. They'd had her wedding rehearsal, all went smoothly, but unbeknownst to the bridal party, after it was over, the organist announced to the pastor, I quit. Well, the pastor heard him, but didn't think he meant on the spot. The next day comes, and the organist did not show up for the wedding. The congregation ended up humming the bridal march. True story. But ironically, these are a dime a dozen, by the way, these horror stories between pastors and organists. They're really something to hear about. But ironically, I think one of the things that I appreciate most about Burl is her deep appreciation of the word. How many times has the choir heard her say, think about what you are singing? What do the words say? Have you heard her say that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And something you will never hear from Burl's lips is, I don't care if I can hear the words as long as you sound good. Never. Those in Burl's Bible class and those of us in the congregation are blessed to experience her utterly profound respect for the power of scripture. What pastor wouldn't envy working with someone like Burl? And what a choir bursting at the seams in summertime. Is this your first time, Burl, where you've had a choir willing to sing all year long? Very first time. And how many years? 62. 62 years, first time. They are amazing. Yet here they are, sweltering in this heat. They're here Thursday nights, choir room. And not only are they rehearsing for Sunday mornings, they're rehearsing for August 5th. And they don't even complain, do they, Burl? No, they don't. Yet. <laughs> Burl said, not to me. Yet, they work so hard, and we thank you. It is heartbreaking to me hearing about churches, and one of them is my own, that does not have a choir anymore, and to think about what they are missing Sunday after Sunday. Suffice it to say that something profound happens to us spiritually when God, through music, takes us to places deeper than our own thoughts and more profound than our own emotions. In the time remaining, a little of what I want to say will be in words, the rest will be in music, as Susan and Nancy play Charles Wesley's hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Growing up as a Methodist, I always knew that we had a reputation for loving music and being good singers, but I never understood why. You go to a Methodist church, you sing hymns, and the Methodists will belt them out. At least that's the way we did it. It's kind of like going to Wisconsin and eating bratwursts. It's just what they do. But it wasn't until my renewal leave this past fall that I understood the reason, not about eating bratwurst in Wisconsin, <laughs> but about the robustness of the singing. And what I learned was that it was related to Wesley's transatlantic passage on his way to America. And I've talked about that before. I've mentioned what happened during that violent winter storm when John Wesley assumed he was going to die and was scared out of his wits. But while he was screaming for dear life, the Moravians were singing hymns. 
and God, through their music, was lifting them up where they belonged. And Wesley knew, even as his own voice deafened him, that he wanted what they had. And so from then on, music, the singing of hymns, played a major role in his worship services. And as you know, his brother Charles was instrumental, pun intended, in being part of that movement through many, many compositions. In today's selection that we're going to be hearing, Rejoice the Lord is King, Wesley's words are based on Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and he adjures them to rejoice, not because of their personal circumstances, but because of their ultimate victory through Jesus Christ. The Lord is King, and that in and of itself is plenty enough reason to rejoice. Over time, after Aldersgate, the Wesleys came to believe that with the core of their being, and we have inherited what they have passed on. I am continually finding new Wesley stories, and one of the accounts I read while I was in Chautauqua was about a stonemason named John Nelson, who found himself living in the midst of the Wesleyan revival. And as it happened, his wife heard Wesley preach, and she was converted. Well, Nelson was furious. He liked her the way she was. And so he cursed her, and he beat her. But there was no recanting. And finally, he decided to take matters into his own hands, so he grabbed a butcher's knife and went after him with every intention of killing Wesley on the spot. He had no trouble finding him, There he was, standing in plain view, a very easy target. But Wesley, on seeing Nelson with murder in his eyes, did not run. He didn't even cower. He just looked him right in the eye and said, Thou art the man. And according to the account I read, Nelson fell to the ground and cried out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Nelson, John Nelson, was not only converted, he became one of the earliest lay preachers in the Methodist movement. And so it was experiences like this that inspired his brother Charles to write words like, Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. The music to the hymn that we're going to be hearing was not written by Wesley. It was instead written by a man named John Darwell, who, in addition to being a preacher, was also an amateur musician. And he believed that church music need not always sound like a Gregorian chant. It needed to have life and energy and vigor in order to best express the fullness of the truth that it was proclaiming. And so he wrote the tune that we are going to hear that accompany the words, Rejoice, the Lord is King. And the music, as you will soon discover, is as lively and as energetic as one could possibly imagine. Quite a contrast with the fare that people were used to hearing. I would have loved to see their faces the first time that hymn was played in a church setting. So I close asking, what are we to do after we have lifted our hearts? and our voices. And I conclude with a very brief story. Once upon a time, there was a huge stone cathedral in northern Europe, which happened to house a magnificent pipe organ. The sexton was reading for Sunday when he heard someone at the door. And the man standing there was a stranger to him. And this man said, I've come a considerable distance to see the organ here. Would you mind? opening the console so I could get a look at it. I'm sorry, said the sexton. I, I, I can't permit you to do that. But the stranger was persistent, and eventually the sexton relented. So the visitor sat there for a while, looking at the keys, until he said, I've come so far, and I know how to play. Do you suppose it would be all right if I, if I played just just a few notes. 
Finally, the sexton gave in, at which point the stranger began to pull out the stops. And the entire cathedral was filled with the most extraordinary music anything unlike the custodian had ever heard played. And stunned, he asked him, excuse me, sir, who are you? What is your name? My name is Mendelssohn, the stranger said. Mendelssohn, who happened to be one of the greatest organists of the 19th century. And after Mendelssohn left the sanctuary, the sexton said, and to think that I almost kept the master from playing music in my cathedral. This story works as a metaphor because so often we are tempted to say no to the master in our lives who so wants to play his music in our souls. What if we allowed him to just let out all the stops, to lift us up where we belong, and to play his magnificent song through us? Let's see what would happen. Amen.